Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our second STEM lecture for the semester. Uh, STEM, as you know, stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Our speaker today is Dr. Sergo Jindariani from Fermi National Laboratory. He's going to talk about the research he's doing there and the questions physicists are trying to answer uh, using their high-speed particle accelerators, such as the ones at Fermi and at CERN. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Jindariani will speak for about 40 minutes or so, and then we should have some time at the end for a Q&A. So let's give a warm welcome uh, to Dr. Jindariani. All right, so thank you guys. I hope you can hear me well in the back. Um, first of all, uh, I wanted to express my gratitude to Troy and Brian for inviting me. I think it's a great opportunity for me to be here today. Uh, to give this presentation, tell you a little bit about the, the science I'm involved in and tell you a little bit about the physics we do and the work that I'm doing. I'll try to stay a little bit away from uh, what I do on a daily basis. I think if, if you guys are interested in this, you can always ask me questions towards the end. I'll try to talk a little bit more about the big picture of, uh, of the questions we're trying to address. and. As you can see from the title, it's about particles. It's about particle physics, and it's about building accelerators and particle colliders to actually try to test the universe or how the universe is built, okay? Um, and um, I'm a scientist at Fermi National Accelerator Lab. I'll tell you a little bit more about the lab as we get there. So one of the questions that people like to ask is why science, right? Why, why do you even care, right? Why do, why do you want to do science? And there are many different ways to answer this question. Um, I like to think about it in the following way. So there are a lot of things that happen to you today. And one thing that you rarely think about is, what does it have to do with something that happened many, many years ago, actually billions of years ago? And it happens so that some things that happen to you today may actually have origins that trace back to the early days of the universe, many, many billions years ago. So let me give you an example of something that may not necessarily have to happen, but actually can possibly happen. Uh, so you buy a computer, it's a laptop, it's a brand new shiny laptop, it works great, you're really happy with it, you know, you're about to use it for your homework or whatever you want, and then it freezes out of nowhere. It doesn't happen so often these days because the technology has advanced quite a bit, but it used to happen quite a bit. And so you ask yourself a question, why, why did this happen? And the reason could be actually a billion years old. So how many of you guys know what is Big Bang Theory? Okay, and I don't mean this one. <laughs> um, although I must say, I'll say one thing about this one. Uh, these guys in their TV show, they actually mentioned some real things in the passing. They, have, they actually have a science advisor who's a very good friend and a collaborator of mine, David Salzberg from UCLA, and he advises them on science. So some of the things that are brought up in the show have to do with reality. But the the Big Bang Theory that I was referring to is this, and so if you read Wikipedia, it's, a basically, it's basically a theory, it's a cosmological model that tells you how the universe was evolving in time. And this is a typical picture that people show when they talk about the universe, the evolution of the universe. So the time um, is shown on this axis. It started from a big explosion, and then there were several stages of evolution of the universe uh, a stage where light was emitted, a very faint light, which we can detect still today. It's called cosmic microwave background. A stage that's referred to dark ages, where this was prior to formation of stars or planets or anything. So there was very little r light in that universe. It was essentially black because there are no sources of light. And then slowly, as things expanded uh, from a very, very dense, very hot state into something that we're more used to seeing today, stars and planets and all the galactic objects started forming. And that's what we see today. And this process, we believe, took roughly 14 billion years. So it's, it's a very long process. So what could have happened that was related to your computer? Well, let me tell you an example. So the Big Bang happened, a uh, big explosion. And as this uh, matter that was initially um, compressed in very low, in very small amount of space, started expanding. And as it started expanding, it started to cool down and matter started forming. And this matter created stars and planets and galactic objects. And depending on the mass and size of a star, 
you can actually get some stars that burst into what we call supernovas, which are very big stars that emit, they, they, they actually emit very, uh, very bright light of very specific brightness. So we can, we, can, we, can, we can really detect them. And what happens when supernova explosion happens, uh, there's a, this explosion that happens creates a debris of nuclei, and the nuclei go in all directions. So some of these nuclear debris can come to the Earth, so they travel in all directions. They hit the Earth atmosphere, they go through the atmosphere, and they hit your laptop. And the cosmic rays have the ability to actually, or at least they had the ability, now the electronics is becoming more advanced, had the ability to flip a bit in the RAM memory and freeze your computer. So somehow it's, it's a very simple thing that had to do with cosmic, cosmic rays which actually made your computer freeze. And the origins of this can be traced back to the origins of the universe. It's a very simple example, but I wanted to engage you a little bit by telling you the story of how things today can be relatable to things uh, many years ago. Um, a slide about myself. Um, I'm a physicist at Fermi National Accelerator Lab. Uh, it's a Department of Energy uh, National Laboratory. I'll tell you a little bit more about this lab. Uh, I got my PhD in physics from University of Florida. I specialized in particle physics research. And since 2018, I'm serving as a coordinator of the Large Hadron Collider Physics Center at Fermi Lab. How many of you guys know what the La Large Hadron Collider is? Okay, well, some of you know, some of you don't know. It's a, it's a particle collider. I'll tell you more about it in a, in a couple of slides. Um, I'll say, I say coordinator because in science we actually don't like the word director because director assumes certain authority, certain powers that I do not possess, so we coordinate. Um, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about the lab itself. Uh, so the lab is located not too far from here. It's about 40 minutes away. Uh, this is Chicago, it's covered by the bison, why the bison is there, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, but it's, it's not too far from uh, Interstate 88, north of it, near Naperville, uh, Batavia, Aurora in this area. Uh, what makes us, I know you guys had speakers from Argo National Lab, which is a little closer to here. What makes us distinct from many nas other national labs is that we're an open lab. Uh, we don't do any, anything that's of um, let's say uh, secrecy, so you can actually get on site. You can drive your car, you can get to the gate, you can show your, show your driver's license and get on site. And there are a lot of public areas you can go to and you can, you can learn about the experiments that are going on there. Uh, there are some areas you cannot get to for safety considerations or for, you know, you don't want to distract people working there, but there are a lot you can learn by just getting on site. And if you're more into nature, and not so much into physics, you can still visit the lab and you can see bisons. So we actually, we have a pretty big site and we have uh, bisons there. And uh, every year we typically get uh, baby bisons. So we, we, get, uh, we get larger population. Uh, so why do we study particle physics? Um, I mean, I think it's in, in general in, in our nature to try to understand how the world around us is, is made. And there are two ways to do this. Uh, one is to go big. And go big, in my opinion, is to look at the sky, right? So you basically look at the uh, objects in the sky, you look at the planets, you look at stars, you look at galaxies, you look at their shape, formation, and uh, you do this in many different ways. You can do it from the Earth. Uh, this is an example of uh, a, a, a telescopic camera that we built at Fermilab, and then we put this in uh, in, inside the Blanco telescope that's located in Chile. And this camera is actually looking at the sky and takes picture, high definition pictures of the sky so that then you can take this data and reconstruct the, the, the shape of galactic objects and do some physics. Or you can do it from, from the sky itself. You can, you can take something, some, some apparatus that does uh, study the, uh, the planets and stars and so on and you can put it on the, uh, in space, you can put it on the Earth orbit, and you can take pictures from there. And this is uh, an example of the AMS experiment that takes pictures from the sky and tries to detect dark matter. But another way to do this is instead of going to larger distances, 
going to large scales, planets, galaxies, you can do, go to smaller pieces. And that's actually also goes back to the ancient world. Every, every, it's kind of in our nature. Now remember when you were little, didn't you want to take a hammer and kind of knock on something and see if it breaks into pieces? I think that's, that's kind of a little bit in our nature. Try to understand what is this thing made of? Are there actually smaller pieces that put, put this thing together? Uh, a little bit of a history, the, the concept of breaking things into little pieces and trying to understand what are the individual pieces that make larger objects can be traced to Democritus back in four, 465 BC. And his idea was that everything around us is made of atoms and there are different types of atoms. So some of them are small and pointy, some of them are large and round. And uh, the slippery things are actually made of special atoms that can slip, easily slip uh, past each other. Well, it's an interesting idea. It actually didn't turn out to be quite true. But what I wanted to mention here, what the point I'm trying to make is that this concept of looking at elementary particles that make our world um, is very old. And it's been there for centuries, essentially. The other question you can ask is, uh, okay, well, you have these particles, but how do they interact with each other? And that's another fundamental question that we're trying to address. And again, if you go back to uh, history and you look at Anaximenes theories, you will learn that he was actually thinking about this many years ago, again, 6 BC. And he was thinking that air is a very fundamental quantity. It's a, it's a very fundamental thing and anything else in the universe was, can be made out of air. Well, it's, it's a very neat theory. It has very few constituents and interactions. Unfortunately, it turned out to be wrong and no experimental observation of this was made. Where major breakthrough happened was in 1871 or so when Mendeleev put together this famous table of uh, different materials. So he tried, he took all the elements that he was aware of and he tried to arrange them in a, in a form of a table so that you can actually predict uh, chemical properties of these materials from, from the location of this element in the table. And that has actually fundamental reasons, underlying fundamental reasons. Later, that went in that another step forward when J.J. Thompson in 1897 discovered an electron. And that led to a different theory, which came up in 1904, which is this famous model of the plum, it's called plum putting model of the atom. It was basically assumed that everything around us is made of these plums, uh, where you have this plumb of positive charge and then the electrons are embedded inside. So it's kind of like a putting. And again, it, it did advance science quite a bit, but the state of the art, what we know today about the world of particle physics can be essentially captured in, in this slide. And I know I'm getting a little bit into technical terms, but you don't need to understand all of this. All, all I want you to capture from this slide is that everything around us is made out of these 12 particles. Uh, some of them you know here, these are electrons, muons, these are neutrinos, you may have heard about neutrinos, and then some of them are quarks. Now, these particles interact, and the interaction between particles is essentially exchange of other particles. So one particle can emit another particle and the second particle can absorb that particle and that's an interaction. And these particles that participate in the interaction are these. And there are four types of interaction. We refer to them as strong, electromagnetic, weak, and gravity. I'm sure you've heard of electromagnetic. It's, it's everywhere. It's, it's in your phone. It's, it's, it's everywhere around us. And I'm sure you've heard about the gravity you may have not heard about the strong and the weak. Strong is actually what bounds nucleus together. And it's the strongest force out there. It's the strongest out of all four. And to give you a comparison, the difference between strength of strong interaction and gravity is for the orders of magnitude. So gravity is a lot, a lot, a lot weaker than strong. And actually what you can see is that these four forces, they vary a lot in, in the magnitude of their strength. So uh, they're not, they're not quite at the same level of strength of interaction. And then there's a little thing here, which we couldn't discover until 2012, which in my opinion is still very recent. It was 2012, so six, seven years ago. The, the Higgs boson. And let me tell you how this thing originated. So the standard model, as we know it, 
this was put together roughly in 1970. Um, it all worked nicely except particles had zero mass. So it, the interaction was, many interactions were described really neatly. Everything was coming together very nicely except you couldn't predict mass for particles. And we know particles are massive. So something doesn't make sense. Something doesn't come together. In 1960s, two theoretical physicists, Peter Higgs and Francois Engler, they created a physics mechanism. I'm not going to get into the math of this, but they proposed a physics mechanism that allowed you to generate masses to the particles. And that was really groundbreaking. It was really a major achievement for standard model because it was completing the standard model. It was, it was really making it a complete theory. But a consequence of this, or I shouldn't say but, a consequence of this was that there was an additional particle, the Higgs boson, that nobody had ever seen. And so the question was, is this mechanism actually a correct mechanism to predict what's going on in nature or not? Maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe it's just a theoretical model that has nothing to do with reality. Actually, it's a little bit difficult to explain in simple terms what the Higgs, Higgs field or Higgs boson is. I try to explain it to you in a very simple terms, but if you go to this YouTube um, video, a colleague of mine at Fermilab is doing an amazing job explaining it with cartoons and things like that. So you can actually look there and you, you'll get a much better idea of what the particle is about. Okay? So I told you about these particles. The question is, can you get the sense of how small they are, right? I, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard, right? If, if you think, if you're looking at the sky, you can maybe try to get a feel for how big are the objects, right? So you can look at the moon and say, okay, well, it's far, but it's probably big. If you look at the sun, it's, it's even bigger. What about galaxies? Well, they're even bigger. So let's give, give you a little bit of a feeling of how small these particles are, right? So this is a logarithmic scale. Uh, one in the middle is one meter. One meter is, well, it's three feet, so it's about this distance. So roughly size of a human, well, half of the size of a human body, okay? Of, uh, of uh, human height. Now we're going down, as we go down, we're going to larger distances. And every time we go by uh, an order of magnitude, we're increasing uh, distance by a factor of 10, right? So 10 to the six is essentially one million meters. And that's roughly the Earth radius. And then as you go bigger and bigger and bigger to the size of the galaxies, you get to the point where you have distances of the order of 10 to the 22nd power meters, right? So that's 22 orders of magnitude bigger than a human body. And that's the size of a galaxy, roughly. So now let's go in the opposite direction. Let's go to smaller distances. And basically what you're doing, again, you're decreasing the distance by a factor of 10. So every time you go by, take by one order of magnitude, you're reducing the distance by a factor of 10. So this is where Higgs boson and other particles live. This is what we probe with accelerators. 10 to the 22, minus 22. So essentially the relation is the same if you were going big from a human body to size of a galaxy, you would go up by 22 orders of magnitude. When you go from human body to elementary particles, you're going down by the same rough distance, by the same relative magnitude. So you're going down by 22 orders of magnitude. Another question you may want to ask is, okay, you're creating these collisions and you're trying to learn you're trying to kind of recreate the conditions of the early universe, right? And I told you that the universe is about 15 billion years old. And the question is, how far down from where we are today you can go with colliders, with particle, where you put particle collisions, where, where you collide particles, and how far in the early universe you can probe? And apparently it turns out that you can probe as early as uh, less than a second after the creation of the universe. So it's actually incredibly, it's actually an incredible thing that by colliding these particles at high energy, you can recreate conditions of the universe when it was only one second old, less than a second old. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about how we do this. And I told you about um, different colliders. So let me highlight two of them. Uh, there are two there were essentially, in the last 20 or 30 years, there were essentially two big particle accelerators and colliders in the world. Uh, there, is, there, are special, uh, there are other colliders that serve special purposes, but these are multi-purpose particle colliders if you want. 
And one of them was located at Fermilab. Again, as I told you, it's only 40 or 50 miles away from here. It took me 40 minutes to get here, so it cannot be too far. It operated from 1983 to 2011, uh, six kilometers of circumference. You can see two rings. This is the injection ring. This is the main ring where the uh, collisions happened. And the energy was two tera electron volts. So it's, uh, it's, it's something that we had operating here until 2011. This is where one of the quarks, top quark, was discovered. Uh, this is a picture of me as a graduate student, maybe 10 years ago, roughly or so, working on one of the experiments here, some, uh, around this location on the ring. Uh, it was decommissioned in 2011. It's not operating anymore because at CERN, this is in Switzerland and Europe, another collider came to life. And this collider is a lot bigger. Instead of six kilometers in circumference, you have 27 kilometers. 27 is roughly I would say 17, 18 miles, something like this. So it's pretty big. And the energy of this machine is approximately six or seven times bigger than this. So this is, of course, a, I would say it's a bigger brother. It can, it can really push energies to much higher level than what we had here. That's why we ran at the same time for about three years while this machine was being commissioned and uh, getting to operation. But at some point, you hit the point where this is just by far much more superior. Uh, I do travel, so as a, as a particle physicist, I had the chance to work on both machines. So I worked here at Fermilab from 2003 to 2011 when this machine closed. And in 2008, at the beginning, I started working on this machine and uh, it's running up until today, actually. Um, maybe I'll mention one thing about this is, uh, at the moment, at CERN, they have a shutdown. So we're working on the accelerator to put some improvements in place. And during shutdown, there's some periods of time, you can go to CERN website and, or just Google LHC CERN, and you can find dates of what, they, what we call open days. Um, of course, it will require you to travel to Switzerland, but during open days, you can actually go downstairs into the exper experimental cavern and see what's going on there. Um, so this gives you a feeling of the footprint of the Large Hadron Collider at, at CERN in Switzerland. So this is, uh, you can see here the blue uh, ring, with the, which was the, roughly the size of the, this, this, the, the little canal or the, uh, the artificial river here, circular river here was just above the Fermilab accelerator. And so you can see that the, the European accelerator really dwarfs this one because uh, this is a lot smaller than this. Of course, the location is different. I just drew them on the same picture for, to, to demonstrate the size differences. The actual accelerator is lo located underground. Um, you can see Alps. This is not Geneva, Illinois. This is Geneva, Switzerland. And the accelerator is located approximately 100 meters. The collider is located approximately 100 meters below the surface of the Earth. Um, you can see four experiments here, LHCB, ATLAS, LEs, and CMS. These are detectors that allow you to detect the collisions. I'm working on this CMS one, the closest to the front of the picture. I'll show you a little bit more about this. Uh, so how does this uh, collider work? And uh, the way it works, essentially, you fill the string with bunches of particles. Um, I I didn't manage to draw all of them because they're actually up to 5,600 bunches inside the, the, uh, the accelerator. They're separated in space and time, so they're constantly rotating around the circle. And then in places where you want to collide them, you steer the beams. They're everywhere else. They just pass by each other. They don't collide. But then certain points, you steer the beams to each other, and then they just basically go head to head and collide. And what happens is a collision happens and then there are a lot of other particles that come up, okay? It all starts with this little tiny bottle because we're colliding protons. Uh, one interesting question is where, where do all these protons, particles that we collide come from? And apparently it all can start from a single bottle and the bottle is not too big. You can, you can see the size of it, it's about this big. And apparently it turns out that this bottle of hydrogen is sufficient to refill the Large Hadron Collider approximately 100,000 times. So if you, if you got this bottle once, you don't need to ever do it again. This is, this is enough for the lifetime of the accelerator. And I don't know if I mentioned to you on the previous slide, but each bunch contains 10 to 11 protons. So you can imagine how many protons are inside this bottle, right, if you can refill it 100,000 times. 
So one question people always ask me is, so you've created these beams of particles, and how do you actually control them? How do you accelerate them, and how do you steer them so that they stay on the perfect trajectory, right, circulating around the, uh, the ring? So there are two things. For acceleration, we use special devices. They're called radio frequencies, RF cavities. And what they look like is something like this. So this is a device that creates this alternating electric field. And we put a bunch of them next to each other. And what happens is the beam goes around. And as it gets to this device, it goes in the middle of this device. And there's an electric field that's in phase with the particles going through. So as the particle bunch passes through, it gets a little bit of a, of a hit forward, right? It gets a little bit of uh, acceleration. And since particles are going circularly again and again and again and again, every time they pass by the station, they get a little bit of a kick. Eventually, they reach their nominal energy and they stay there. They lose a little bit of energy as they go around the ring, they slow down. But as they hit this position again, they get this kick and then they keep going at the constant energy. You can see a picture of the, of the LHC tunnel here and you can see these devices installed. The other question is, okay, well, you accelerate them, but wouldn't they just go straight and uh, not ever bend? Well, of course, um, they will, unless you put some magnetic field there. And I'm not gonna get into the equation, I'm just, I'm just gonna tell you that there is a Lorentz force, um, and I'll write the equations for you so that you can do the homework later. Uh, but essentially what this means is, as particles go straight, uh, if you put a magnetic field there, there will be a force that makes, makes them go towards the center. So essentially bends the trajectory of a particle. So they always stay on, on perfect uh, circular orbit. Uh, the LHC uses eight Tesla dipole magnets. You can see a picture of one of them here. Uh, eight Tesla is a lot actually. Well, for some of you who know about MRI technology and things like that, this is not by no means a record. Uh, these days people can go up to up to 20 Tesla, I would say. But these are very special magnets. They have to survive in harsh radi radiation environment and things like that. So they're very cool. Each one of, there are about 1,200 of these dipoles in the accelerator. And each one of them is about 15 meters long and weighs about 35 tons. Uh, these are superconducting magnets. They operate at the temperature of roughly zero, well, close to zero, absolute zero, cal well, these are two Kelvins. And if nominal magnets were used, like non-superconducting magnets, the size of the accelerator would have been about five times bigger. Now, you already have 27 kilometers. You don't want to push it to 100 something. Okay, so you've accelerated the beams. You've uh, steered the beams. So it's, it's all good now. Uh, well, now you want to collide them. So as I told you, 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 find a, you, you define a point where you actually make the beams go towards each other. So they hit head on. There's a boom, and then a lot of other particles come out, right? So how do you detect them? Well, first of all, it happens a lot in the LHC because you have a lot of bunches, and they go around at incredible velocity, close to the speed of light. So you get roughly 4 million collisions per second. That's a lot, right? 40 megahertz of collisions per second. You cannot actually even write, that, write out that many. You, you have special systems. One of the things I'm working on is a special system that allows you to select interesting a uh, few, few thousand interesting collisions amongst those 40,000 and write them out on disk or tape. Uh, but how do you actually detect particles? And for that, we build these incredible devices called detectors. I told you there are four of them around the ring. Uh, this is, I'm giving you an example of the one I'm working on because this is my favorite. And you can see the, um, well, I'm not going to get into the details of this, but you can see the size of it. This is a human uh, working on it. Like for, for, for relative comparison, you can see the size of a human. So this thing is very tall. It's about uh, 12 meters. So we're talking about 40 feet, something like this. This is the beam line. So the beam, one beam is entering from this side. The other beam is entering from the other side. And then in the middle of this detector, the collision takes place. Um, as this happens, uh, particles go in different directions, and they're different particles. So that's why the detector is layered. You can see there are different technologies, different, different types of detectors that make up the big detector to detect these particles. Uh, this is a picture of Peter Higgs. 
please remember the scientist who came up with the mechanism. He's standing in the, at, the, at the bottom of the uh, collision hole, we call it. Uh, and you can see uh, the size of the detector. As it, 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 comes, it comes apart, actually, because you may want to work on some of the pieces during the shutdown. So you can see the two pieces were taken, taken away from each other, and so you can, you can get in and work on some of the electronics. This is a picture of uh, where the core of this, the central part of the detector, was being inserted into the, into the detector. So just a couple of pictures for you to see. So I told you 40, millions collisions, 40 million collisions per second, that's a lot of data. And actually CMS produces over one gigabyte of data per second. So if your hard drive with your laptop roughly, well, let's say one terabyte, it would fill in in approximately, what, a thousand seconds, something like this. So a few minutes and it's all full. And remember that uh, a Large Hadron Collider operates almost um, around a year, so nine months, nine, ten months a year. So you can imagine how much data there is. To analyze this data, we have to use uh, distributed computing or what we, uh, what we call grid. Uh, this picture shows you map of various computing centers around the globe. You can see some in Europe, some in US, uh, in Asia, and so on. To analyze, to reconstruct and analyze the data takes about 250,000 cores, 70 sites, 250,000 cores. At the moment, we have 150 petabyte disk space that we use, and that's the core minimum. That's what we access essentially constantly. And then there's another additional data, approximately 200 petabytes of used tape space. So the tape is serving as additional storage to the disk. The disk provides you quick access to the data. The tape provides you a little slower access to the data, but it can store a lot more. Okay, so one question people ask is, okay, you, you have this humongous machine, and how, my, how many people does it take to actually build it, operate it, do the data analysis? Well, it's a lot of people. Uh, in case of CMS, it's about 2,700 physicists, 180 institutions from 43 countries around the globe. Uh, the U.S. contributes to about 30% of CMS and makes key contributions. So what kind of science comes out of it? Remember I told you about the Higgs boson. It was predicted. It was never observed until 2012. And how can you actually observe it? Well, you collide particles, you create the Higgs boson, and then you say, how can I see it? Well, unfortunately, it's not that easy because you cannot see it directly. Once you created the Higgs boson, it immediately decays. It's very unstable, it immediately decays. And it decays, it can decay into two Z bosons and other particles, heavy particles, Zs. And these Zs are also not stable, so each in turn decays into either a pair of electrons or a pair of muons. So what can you do? You cannot see the Higgs directly, but what you can do is you can find events where you have electrons and muons, you find these objects, you measure their momenta and the energy, and then what you do is using this famous Einstein's equation, you calculate the mass, because you know momenta, p's, you know energies, e's, and all you have to do is plug in the speed of light, c, and just calculate m, and that's, that's the mass of the Higgs. So I promised you one equation, this is, this is it. Let me show you one example of what we call candidate Higgs events. Uh, so this is a, an event display of an event, an actual event that happened in our detector. Uh, it shows you a collision, a one single collision, a whole bunch of particles coming out, so a lot of uh, secondary particles. And then you can see two rays, two green rays, these are electrons, and two red rays, which are the muons. So it looks like a Higgs event. We don't know actually if this is definitely a Higgs event or not, because there are some processes in, uh, in the standard model, other processes non, not involving Higgs that can also produce similar signature, but it could be a Higgs event. And you cannot really do it on event by event basis. You cannot just say, well, this is Higgs, this is not Higgs for these type of events, but you can do it statistically, right? If you, if you combine, let's say you found 100 events like this, and you predict that non-Higgs non uh, contributions give you roughly 20. Well, you have a clear evidence that the Higgs is there, right? Because you predicted 20, you see 100, and the Higgs predicts you another 80. So it all kind of makes sense. So, how does it actually happen? So let me show you uh, a real cartoon. I thought this was entertaining. So this is the mass. I told you, you know, you can find these electrons and muons. You can 
calculate the mass using their directions, using their momenta and energy. And then what you can do is plot this mass. And the red curve here and the purple curve here are a sum of all the other processes that we know of that can happen, that can happen, that give you the same signature, okay? So the Higgs is not there. We don't know if the Higgs is there or not, so we're gonna plot all the other ones, but we're not gonna plot the Higgs. And then let's start taking the data and see what, we, what happens. So this is a cartoon as the data starts coming in. This is actually not as quick. In, in real time, it didn't happen as quickly. It took actually two, two years, roughly, to collect all this data and to plot this histogram. But start looking at this region, around 120 or 125. This is where the Higgs is. So you can see everywhere else, the data agrees with the red curve. So everywhere else, it looks like it's just the background events, that just the other events. But around this area, you can see there's an excess of data events. And then as you plug in the Higgs, the prediction for the Higgs, the blue, then it all fits together, right? So what this shows you is we looked at this distribution of mass, and we saw that in one particular area, there was an excess of events that cannot be predicted by all the other processes. And then we plugged in the prediction from, from theorists for what the Higgs boson event, events would look like, and it matched perfectly. So that's how we concluded that this is actually what we, uh, what we see. Um, okay, so this was in July 2012, and we found it, right? So uh, we found the Higgs boson. It was, it was really a major thing, and then 2013, these two guys that came up with uh, the mechanism 40 years before, remember 1965 when this uh, mechanism was proposed, roughly, uh, in 2013 is when these guys got a call and were notified that they're gonna receive Nobel Prize, and they, you can read the text, but it's basically for the invention of the, the theoretical mechanism that it describes uh, masses, that it allows to generate masses for particles and results in, in, in the Higgs boson. So what did we learn so far, right? So it's, it's a good question. Uh, well, first of all, there was a big celebration. Uh, you can see this was uh, on the day of the announcement at CERN. This is CERN Auditorium. This is where big presentations take place. Uh, fits a lot of people, I don't know roughly how many, probably a couple thousand, maybe not quite, at least a thousand, I would say. Um, and you can see the director of CERN and a few other prominent scientists celebrating and a lot of people, the auditorium is filled. And this was the day when the discovery was announced. Actually, people showed the plots that I showed you today. And what we learned is that the standard model is now complete. Uh, we have all these particles that make the matter. We, we've seen all of them. Uh, we've seen the force carriers. We've also, we've also seen that. And finally, we've seen the Higgs boson. So now the model is complete. We, we found every single particle that was predicted. Seems great, right? I mean, it seems like um, it's time to maybe relax, go to Cancun, have a beer, and just uh, have fun. So why don't we stop, right? Why are we not stopping? Well, it's so great. I think it's a, it's a major achievement for science. And um, I think it was actually incredible to be there, to take part in it, and to witness it, something that could be, at least to me, the biggest discovery of my life. So it, it's really incredible. But there's still a lot of questions that we don't know the answers to. And you guys may have heard about the problems of dark matter and dark energy. Maybe yes, maybe not. Let me just highlight that at a very high level. If we take everything we know about all the different materials, all the particles that make up the standard model, and try to calculate the mass of all the objects in the universe, we can only account to 5% of that. So you ask, where did the rest 95% go? And we don't know. We know that about 25% of this is dark matter. We think that dark matter is other, other particles, particles that we haven't seen. They have some other properties. That's why we cannot detect them. But we want to detect them. We want to understand what this dark matter is. The other 70% is dark energy. So what is dark energy? It's not even, we don't even know if it's a particle or something else. All we know is that when the, the universe expands, you expect it to actually slow down, right? Imagine. A burst happened, things go out, and as they go out, it's like a, a, a sonic wave. As it goes out, it should slow down, right? But that's not what's happening. The universe is actually accelerating, 
as it expands. If gravity was the only force taking play here, you would gravity pulls things together. So you expect things to slow down and eventually start, start contracting, going back together. That's not what's happening at the moment. The universe is going out and it's going out faster and faster. So there must be something inside the universe that fills the universe, some field, something, we don't know what, that pushes it out. So that's one question and maybe, maybe we can probe it in um, collisions. The other big question is, okay, so we've seen matter, right? We've seen, we're, we're all made of matter. We know electrons, we know protons and all the other particles. Now, in theory, there's also antimatter. For every particle, there's an antiparticle. We can create them. We can create them in artificial conditions, right? In accelerators, we can, we can see them. We can create antimatter, but in small quantities. So what happened to all the antimatter in the universe? It should have been created equally in the early days during the Big Bang, right after the Big Bang. But something happened, which we don't know, that made all the antimatter extinct. And all that's left was matter. Now, this is a good thing, of course, because our world would have been like it is today if uh, it would have just uh, annihilated and we wouldn't exist. But we still want to understand why this happened. The last thing is, it's a little bit it may be not as fundamental as some of the other things that I described to you, but it's still there. And it has to do with the way physicists think. So we want to create a theory of everything. We want our standard model, a new standard model, let's say, standard model two, to be able to explain everything, all the interactions. Unfortunately, this is not how it works. The standard model right now only describes three interactions, electromagnetic, weak, and strong. Gravity is so weak and operates at such a large distances that it's completely decoupled from the standard model. It's described by a very different theory, which is called general relativity. So how do these things come together? Maybe they don't, but we, we like to think that they do, and there's some more fundamental law there that puts all of us together into a single or a more fundamental interaction. But at the moment, we don't know why it is. And we're not quite comfortable with having one type of theory for small distances and a different type of theory for big distances. My last slide is on the future colliders. So the, the, um, the CERN machine will operate for the next 15 years or so. Uh, it will uh, take us to roughly 2035 and we will collect 20 times more data than we have today. So we'll have a lot more answers. We'll have a lot more data to analyze. There may be new discoveries happening. I'm not excluding this as a possibility. When I said Higgs boson was perhaps the biggest discovery of my uh, life, it could be other things. We don't know. Uh, but people are starting to think about what else you can do. And so there are some plans around the globe. Uh, one of them is called Future Circular Collider in Europe. Um, it's basically based around CERN, around the LHC. But it's a bigger ring. It's approximately four times bigger ring than the LHC. So it goes you from 26 to about 100 kilometers. And you can see this aerial view of this. This is the current accelerator, and the new one would go under the lake of the Lake Geneva and be four times bigger and have energy of about seven times bigger. Uh, there's plants in China, which are similar to Europe. They have a little bit smaller ring, approximately 80 kilometers, but the concept is very similar. There's ILC in Japan. Uh, the ILC stands for International Linear Collider. And in this case, instead of having a circular machine, you have a linear machine. You basically push one beam from this side, the other beam from the other side, and you collide them in one, one place. Uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages of this approach. If you guys are interested, you can ask a question. I can tell you about this. But it's a different approach. It's, it's not superior. It, it has some pros and some cons. The United States is currently focusing on non-collider neutrino physics, which means that we're not focusing on colliders. We're thinking, at Fermilab in particular, we're thinking about creating beams of neutrinos, which are non-interacting particles or very weakly interacting particles. They just go through matter. They don't leave any trace. You don't need a tunnel or anything. And then you send them at la large distances, and you detect them in South Dakota, for example. Um, next year, there will be a process called SNOMAS, where physicists from the U.S. will come together and discuss the plans for the next decade or two. Uh, I think it's too early to say what the plan will be, but we will be discussing this and see how U.S. will play in this game. And uh, we're a little behind other plans, so we need to catch up with this. 
Um, this is it. You can go to these two links. Uh, one is uh, Fermilab YouTube channel, and it has a lot more videos and a lot more explanation of what's taking place at Fermilab. The other one is a corresponding link for CERN, and you will learn a lot more there. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to extend my gratitude to all of these people from whom I uh, either borrowed ideas or had some conversations with them, and uh, they helped me put this together. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? So uh, when you were talking about like uh, uh, antimatter and how we can't really like detect it, like or if we don't even we can't find like any clumps, uh, is it possible that as opposed to like regular matter, it can't like form any substance that we can detect itself, and it just repels instead of like because it's how matter has like gravity, and that's what keeps um, electrons, protons, and neutrons together. Uh, it just separates into like its uh, individual parts, and it can't really form a substance to detect. Uh, I think what you're describing is in the essence correct. So in, in the standard model, you actually don't differentiate interactions between particles and antiparticles. So within the model that we ca currently have, there's no mechanism that would uh, create an interaction for regular particles that an antiparticle would not participate in, okay? They, they're, they're symmetric. Uh, what we believe happens is either their new force, new type of interaction that only antiparticles participate in, or what's more plausible is the strength of interaction in one of these interactions that I already described, one of the four that we know about, varies slightly between particles and antiparticles. So what happens then is there's an asymmetry that's created between particles and antiparticles, and if antiparticles, let's say, participate in the interaction more actively, they might have been, uh, they might have created certain conditions that led to their extinction. But yes, it has to be either new force or modification to the existing forces that would explain this. Thank you. Um, I actually have a couple of questions. Uh, let's start with when you said that Big Bang Theory, matter was formed, what type of matter? Like I know there's like an element, these are all matters, but at the beginning, how did, what did it start as? So again, um, I think we can, uh, there, are various, um, there are various ideas about what exactly was happening during the evolution of the universe. If you, if you follow the traditional thinking, um, when the, uh, when the universe is contained in a very small amount of space, uh, you can think of its condition to be extremely high temperatures, extremely high energies concentrated in small amount of space. In this condition, all particles essentially act, I'd say they act like a plasma, so there's almost no differentiation between all the particles. So they act exactly the same because the energy is so hot. As things start falling, falling out, right, as the universe starts expanding, the temperature drops down, and this is where particles acquire their properties. So this is where you, for example, start seeing quarks, you start seeing electrons, and then eventually they start bounding together to form atoms. So for you form hydrog hydrogen atom, for example, and things like that. And that's where you start forming stars and galaxy objects and things like that. So yes, it's the, it starts from very fundamental particles, we believe, that the ones that I described to you in the standard model, and then these start forming bound states and that's that. That's le that leads to formation of large galactic objects. Um, if you don't mind, to when are you get, like when is expected to finish the one hundred kilometer collider? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it's a it's a science question and it's a political question. These machines they are very costly, and uh, just to give you a scale of the cost, the to build a machine like this in today's accounting would probably take anywhere between 10 and 20 billion dollars. Uh, it cannot be a single nation, um, it cannot be a single nation effort. There's not enough money, for example, in the in scientific funding of a single country to actually build something like this. So it has to be an international effort. 
where we stand at the moment is CERN is proposing this, uh, the European lab is proposing this as a possible way to go forward. Uh, the plans uh, for selecting the next machine uh, are expected to converge sometime next year. Then they will seek international contributions. So they will go around the globe and talk to the funding agencies of other countries and see if they can together uh, come up with sufficient funding for, for the future generation of accelerators. This doesn't mean that the money gets um, wire transferred to, uh, to Europe. What it really means is uh, there are physicists, for example, in the United States that possess certain expertise that's incredibly valuable for building these machines. Nobody else in the world can do this. Essentially, the, Europe, the, the US funding agency has to commit certain amount of money for these people to build that equipment, eventually to be installed and run at CERN. So it's not so much about sending money, it's about committing to building some parts of the equipment, like magnets, for example, high field magnets, that would eventually be shipped, installed, and commissioned uh, in that ring. But of course, the nation that builds the tunnel takes on major expenses. So with these, like, since these are basically like particles just colliding, and it's a chain reaction that follows a system, like, when you guys know it's over, and like, how do you guys just basically like empty out the entire thing itself and like start it all over again? Um, yeah, so remember they keep, the, the beams keep circulating and they're devices inside the tunnel that measure intensity of the beam. So how many protons are inside of each punch. What happens is as you keep colliding them, remember there are 10 to the 11 protons in each punch, right? So when, you, when they collide, only a few of them uh, participate in, an, in the interaction. So it takes a long time for punches to become depleted. And then at that point, you empty the ring and you put the new set. Roughly, it happens once or twice a day, depending on uh, the conditions. So sometimes you create conditions that are initially you get higher intensity and then it slowly drops off and then you refill faster. Uh, depends on the mode of the operation, but once or twice a day. And you judge based on those, the measurements of those special equipments that tell you about how intense the bunches are. Are there any risks associated with the particle collider, say, similar to <laughs> like a nuclear plant? Uh, I, I don't think so. What you, d you don't want to be inside the collision cavern, of, of course, when the collisions take place, and you wouldn't be for, uh, due to a number of safety regulations. I mean, it's, it's actually not easy to get there, to get inside for me, somebody who's working on these devices during, uh, not even during, op during operation, it's impossible. But I even during shutdowns, there are a lot of regulations that make sure that people get inside and outside safely and they work safely in that environment. Um, there are no, to my knowledge and to the knowledge of the scientific community, there are no risks associated with this. Uh, people always bring up the idea of black holes and creation of black holes. I want to remind you that we're talking about microscopic black holes. These are not even the object, the black holes that you see in the sky. These are the reason why they're called black holes is because they contain a lot of energy in small amount of space, and thus these objects can basically decay to any particle you want. But these are not uh, the same objects that you see, for example, what you call black, black, black holes in the sky. Uh, so no, it's, it's, uh, of course it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a costly scientific endeavor. It, it costs money, it takes a lot of effort of people. Uh, I think it advances the science incredibly um, I don't think there are safety issues with this. Any other questions? Can you comment, can you comment about the, sorry, can you comment about the design of Hermes slider where you have the double ring versus the larger chemo ring that CERN has? Like yeah, CER, CERN also has a smaller ring actually, uh, but the, diff, the main difference between the two is uh, we were colliding protons and antiprotons, whereas they collide protons with protons. Um, the issue with pro antiprotons is you have to create them. They are antimatter, so you have to create them by hand. But at the energies we were exploring, there is um, 
The probability of creating interesting events such as Higgs when you collide protons and antiprotons is actually a little higher than protons, protons. So uh, there's advantage and disadvantage. It's, higher, it's harder to make them, but you get more out of them, okay? But because you have, you have this um, antiprotons, you have to have a secondary ring where you store them and then re-inject them into the main ring. Uh, CERN has smaller rings, but they don't need such a big secondary ring because of, because of this reason. The, the rough size, yes, yes. And it's not really, I don't think it's physically located above each other. It's just, the, I think it's the perspective of, it's the view that you get, but they're, they're really kind of next to each other. They're maybe a little bit elevated with respect. I don't know exactly. But uh, in terms of the size, yeah, the, this gives you roughly the, the comparison of the size of the two rings, yes. But in terms of the chemical compound in, in the two rings? It's roughly the same. So it's about 400 GeV at the injector level. And then in one case, it was going, out, going up to 2 TeV. And then the LHC case, it's uh, 13. So I think what you can do, and again, this is now we're entering a territory where I'm sure all, every scientist has his, own, has his own or her own opinion about this. But the way I think about this is um, by studying LHC collisions or collider collisions, you can constrain theories. So you can constrain internal parameters of the theories. And then these theories will give you a hint on what's going on inside the black holes. Um, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of different types of theoretical models that predict what the origin of dark matter is. Unfortunately, we haven't seen dark matter. We, we think we might see it in either in colliders or other experiments. But once you see it, what you want is to say, okay, this theory, this model, this theoretical model is the one that actually correctly describes the dark matter. And that's where these machines come in and help you. All right, another round of applause for our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Jindarian.